Hello everyone and welcome to episode 336 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How's it going today, Richard? Hey, Seth. Doing well. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, too. We have made it through another spoiler season. But before we get into that, we got another co-host. And Krim, Krim, how are you this fine Monday? Morning, Seth. Uh, I'm pretty excited. This D&D set looks like it's going to uh, it's gonna be having a lot of sweet new cards. So, excited. Yeah, me, me too. That is one of our big topics for today. We actually just got the full spoiler for Adventures in Forgotten Realms. So we know the whole set, I think, as of last podcast, we had a handful of cards. We essentially have a whole new magic set in the past week since our last podcast. So we're going to talk about a lot of new spoiler cards. Also, we got a couple other topics, uh, some pioneer news, some magic adjacent game news that we wanted to hit up quickly first. And then we're going to spend the rest of the cast talking about sweet new adventures in the Forgotten Realms cards. But before we get into that, a quick reminder that our show today is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, you've probably heard about them from us before. They're a great way to sell your magic collection, and they have a new service geared towards selling smaller batches of valuable cards with reduced service fees. With their curated shipment service, you can sell your cards at the best available buy list price with only a 5% service free. And as with all of Card Conduit services, you don't gotta sort your cards, you don't gotta grade your cards, all you gotta do is safely pack them up and ship them out in a of course, you'll get a detailed report with all the results. So check out Card Conduit's curated shipment option as a way to buy list up to 150 cards with fast processing, optimized prices, and the low, low service fee of just 5%. And right now, you can even get a 10% discount by going to cardconduit.com slash goldfish. Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards. So thank you to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And uh, let's, let's talk some magic. Let's start... <laughs> Let's start first with some news that literally made me crack up when I first heard about it. Richard, uh, we, have, we have some news about a, a Magic adjacent game recently. Why don't you tell us what's going on with Magic Legends? All right. Magic Legends put out a statement this week that they're shutting down October 31st. They are refunding everyone the real money they spent through like the Epic Game Store and stuff like that. So uh, that's good on them. But they are shutting down, and that's it. And now, until I guess it's shut down, instead of paying money, uh, you use in-game currency to get your stuff. But shocking because the game is still in beta. It like never made it out of beta, so uh, I I don't I don't know. It seemed a little early to fold, but I guess there was just like no interest, so they just gave up on it. Uh, but. <laughs> That, that was the news it, out of Magic Legends. It cracked me up when I heard that because it was only like a couple of months ago that it was launching and they were doing like a streamer day to launch it. And I think it was the beginning of March. So the total lifespan of the game was six months, I think, roughly from when it launched to when they will be shuttering it. I don't know much about similar games. I assume that that's not how it's supposed to go and games are supposed to last a little longer for six months. But uh but yeah, so I guess disappointing news for Magic Legends fans uh, everywhere. What do, what do you think, Krim? Did you actually play it at all? Yeah. Uh, so like I played it from like a lo- uh, like from its launch, I guess, of like open beta, uh, which I guess is now only been a, has only been like six months or so. But uh, yeah, like I I played it a bit. Uh, but you know, I played it pretty solid for month the first month, and then I think it got a bit repetitive. Uh, and not a lot really there afterwards. So I, I think a lot of it still st- like stems from the fact that it was originally marketed or t- sold to everybody as like a magic MMO. Uh, and then it kind of became an ARPG. And that was a l- little bit of a letdown for a lot of people. I-, I-, I think the game had a lot of potential at the same time as an ARPG. But I feel that it was also just, I don't know, they did, it wasn't capitalized upon. Like the, the, there was a lot there and still a little bit of buggy. And I think a few of the paywall stuff kind of upset people. Yeah. It, it just yeah. felt not magic y enough, right? If you told me there was a magic game, I expect to be Jace Bellerin or Chandra or something, not just like generic fantasy monsters with like loosely magic related things and the thing that got me the most is we were going to play it 
right? Like regardless of their marketing stuff, we were going to play it. But then when we tried to get an account, we realized it was just three player multiplayer, which is super awkward because our Commander Clash pod is four players. Uh, most games are four players. Not many games are three player games. So it was just a really weird number to make work. But if they just had made it four players, we would have played it. And people in the Goldfish community would have seen us playing together. And maybe that would have helped the game out. But it was just awkward. Like, just give me just, just give me a Chandra game or something where I shoot fireballs at people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be a Chandra game shooting fireballs at people in the near future. I don't think, even with this uh, flop, that these magic-related games are going to stop. It sounds like that's a big part of the plan for the future, and it is worth saying that this game wasn't made by Wizards. From what I was reading about it, they kind of like licensed out their magic IP to another company or studio that made the game, so it wasn't directly made like in-house by Wizards, but still a, uh, a pretty quick life cycle for, <laughs> for uh, Magic Legends. Speaking of quick life cycles, <clears throat> we also got some other news this week about Pioneer, and basically, Wizards posted their, their weekly announcements for Arena, and they finally addressed Pioneer Masters, and they basically said, uh, historic's going really well. Pioneer is not especially on our roadmap. We don't expect Pioneer Masters to be a set in the next year. Our focus is on Pioneer, which, reading between the lines, kind of sounds like don't get your hopes up for Pioneer coming to Magic Arena. Uh, it's all about historic now. We've been talking about Pioneer for a while, and there was so much hype a year ago, and then it really fell off hard, and we've been pointing to two things to make Pioneer kind of rise from the ashes. One is Return to Paper Magic, the other was it coming to Arena. Now it's not, apparently, at least in the near future, coming to Arena. Is Pioneer dead? Like, after the big hype's launch just, like, a, just a year and a half ago, is the format already on its way out? What do you guys think about the future of Pioneer in the light of this announcement? It, it, it looked like we were kind of getting, like, some work on the Pioneer format with the bannings and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, like you had mentioned, I think it, it was, like, really relying on its release on Arena to, like sur like, breathe life back into the format. As I don't think Moto is enough to just carry it. Uh, but yeah, because I mean, like Moto, I feel like right now everybody's just playing it to play modern and cube and stuff like that. So I don't know. I mean, the, it's kind of a bummer, right? Cause I mean, the format was cool. Uh, I wanted to get to play a lot of cards, like, you know, with like Oath of the Gatewatch cards, like Kalidus and things like that. So now I'm just kind of sad. I won't get to see Kalidus more than anything else. Uh, <laughs> at least unless I play like older formats. But yeah, for for right now, it really needed the the help from Arena. What do you think, Richard? Eh, I think it's too many formats for Arena. So when they started going hard on Historic, like that was it for Pioneer. Like I don't think you would have two quote unquote eternal formats on Arena. Like, you, you want everyone playing standard and limited and then just have something to point people to for the other format. Uh, and that would be historic now. So I think Pioneer's dead. Like, Pioneer will eventually happen again. So Modern was one of the causes for Pioneer. Like, Modern kind of sucked. So people didn't want to play Modern. But now that Modern's good again, we're like, yeah, Modern's fine. But eventually... Pioneer will come back, right? When Modern gets too big, uh, Pioneer will happen, and then Modern will become the new Legacy. Legacy will become the new Vintage. Vintage will be some, you know, rich people collector's game. And then uh, you you will have Pioneer again, right? We will have Frontier, Pioneer, whatever you want to call it. There will be a cutoff of new cards where we play 2021 20, Magic Forward or something, right? So it, it will happen. Maybe not now, but it will come back. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I land. I do think that and it hurts to say this because I really enjoyed Pioneer when it first launched, but I do think Pioneer is mostly dead now. If you got a good like local scene and people are playing your LGS, like that's awesome. But with it not coming to Arena and big paper tournaments apparently not happening until next year at the earliest and modern really thriving right now, uh, it's hard for me to imagine Pioneer making a big comeback at this point. But I do definitely agree with Richard that 
I think there will be a format between standard and modern at some point. Uh, maybe it'll be, you know, next year. Maybe it'll be Pioneer. Maybe it'll have a different name. Maybe it'll be five years from now. But sooner or later, I do think it's inevitable that we're going to have a in-between format. And we've seen modern getting really expensive in the wake of Modern Horizons, too. Like, I've been kind of shocked at the deck prices. And that could be the thing that is eventually the catalyst to make that happen is modern just pricing people out because people can't afford $1,000 decks and all of a sudden Pioneer and $500 decks or $200 decks or $300 decks starts looking pretty appealing again. So I would say for the short term, Pioneer is pretty much over, but I still think eventually Pioneer or something very similar will be a supported and hopefully thriving format, but it might take a few more years to get there at this point. Anyway... Let's talk, uh, let's talk some adventures in the Forgotten Realms. We have roughly an infinite number of spoiler cards to talk about. Like, literally the entire set has been spoiled since our last podcast. No way we can get through everything. You can see the full set, though, over at mtdpreviews.com. But we're going to go through some of our favorite, most exciting cards from the set. Richard, take it away. Lead us through some spoilers. All right. Well, we'll start off with Demolich. It's a blue mythic at blue, 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 blue. So four mana value, all blues. Uh, creature, skeleton, wizard. This spell costs uh, blue less to cast for each instant or sorcery spell you've cast this turn. Whenever Demolich attacks, exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Copy it. You may cast the copy. You may cast Demolich from your graveyard by exiling four instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard in addition to paying its other costs. I, I love this card. 4-3. Four, 4-3, three. Four, three, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I love this card. I think this card is so cool. Um, the ability to constantly return itself uh, it is going to be sweet, and on top of that, you get to uh, you get to like cast a copy right off of anything that you attack when, when this thing attacks. Of course, this thing will have to attack, but with the recursion, we're hoping that you know, like you can kind of just keep attacking with this over and over, pass th uh, through the removal. Yeah, I think this is the best non-standard card from the set. I think. It probably can see some amount of play in standard, kind of like Stormwing Entity. Stormwing Entity sees play in standard, but it really shines once you get back to Historic and Pioneer and especially Modern. The cost reduction aspect of this, a little bit tricky in standard because standard doesn't have like that critical mass of cheap or free instant and sorceries. But even like Historic, that's not that far back from standard. I could see this showing up in like, is it Phoenix decks where you just kind of like brainstorm Faithless Looting, Lightning Axe, cast this, start flashing stuff back. It recurs, so it works well with Arclight Phoenix. It actually kind of cares about a lot of the same things. Casting three spells in a turn gets us to one mana, it gets back your Arclight Phoenixes. So it does tend to work really well with an Arclight Phoenix plan. And once you get to modern, then things get really crazy because you have cards like Manamorphos, you have Mutagenic Gross, you have Lava Darts. It seems pretty possible in modern that you're going to have games where on turn two, someone's just like Manamorphos, Manamorphos, Lava Dart, Lava Dart, cast this for free, start flashing back lightning bolts or whatever. And it's going to be very, very strong. So standard meh, but I think this is one of the top two or three eternal format cards from uh from the whole set really yeah this this card is nuts i i think it's probably the best card in the set especially for eternal formats like casting this reminds me of uro right like this thing never goes away like you just cast some instants and sorceries you play this thing they kill it you just exile your sorceries do it again and then if you ever get to snap and tack off with this thing you get so much value it's like dread uh dread horde arcanist uh, it's a sizable body it's just really good. And I, I can't see it being played in standard as your finisher. This is just your standard finisher where if you have enough of a control shell where uh, you're playing mostly sorceries and instants, then this is your finishing card. Yeah. No, I think that could work. All right. We have a lot of Planeswalkers. We have, <laughs> I guess we have the the Jeskai Planeswalkers here. So let's start off with the white one. Four mana value, Grand Master of Flowers, two white, white, legendary planeswalker, Bahamut. Three starting loyalty, as long as Grand Master of Flowers has seven or more loyalty counters on him, he is a 7-7 seven, seven dragon god creature with flying and indestructible. Plus one, target creature without first strike, double strike, or vigilance can attack or block until your next turn. Plus one, search your library and or graveyard for a card named Monk of the Open Hand, reveal it, and put it 
into your hand. If you search your library, this way, shuffle. And the monk is a one drop. It's a one, it's a single white mana at one one. And when you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on monk of the open hand. Oh, this card's so good. I think I I think this is the best planeswalker from the set. It's a little weird. It's got abilities we haven't seen before, but it defends itself for days. Like the plus one is good defense, shutting out one big creature. The monk, if you get to five mana, you can play this immediately tutor out and play the monk as a chump blocker, which shuts down other stuff. And then if you get to seven loyalty, good lord, it's a seven seven flying indestructible, and it's always on. That's not a loyalty ability, so it's just always a seven seven. So it's on during your turn. Gideon's get big and indestructible, but only on offense. This can play defense. It can play offense. I think this card has a chance in control and has a chance being the top end in aggro where you can take advantage of tutoring out these one ones that grow as you cast extra spells. Uh, I think this is actually a very strong planeswalker. Uh, am I, uh, like, I, I, I don't know. It might just be me. I, I think this thing's just kind of like, okay. It's like... It, 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 <laughs> It looks, I agree with you, Krim. I'm yeah. very confused by Seth's comments. Yeah, uh, uh, you, I don't want this in my control like deck. <laughs> like, I'm not going to dilute my deck with, like, four 1-1s. One yeah, you don't like, want four bugs in your control deck. What are you going to yeah. do with that? Like, this this card, I think, to me, just seems like it looks cool. It looks like it's from the world of Monster Hunter. But other than the art design, like, I think it's, oh, like, meh at best. Only because, to, to be honest with you, th this kind of looks a little bit like the Nissa from Zendikar, where you're able to get like Nissa's chosen. Uh, but this can obviously become a seven seven. But I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really see that <laughs> being too big of a problem. I, let, let me, let me, let me sell you on this post rotation crim. Blue white control. You're a blue white control player. I think I can convince you. Okay. There's another planeswalker in the set that we haven't talked about yet. Morden Kanan. The blue six mana planeswalker, it's plus two ability, is draw two cards and put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library. If you have them both, you plus your grandmaster, get the monk of the open hands, then you plus your mortar and Canaan, draw two, put the monk to the <laughs> bottom, get to do that every turn, eventually get a seven seven and win the game. The, what do you think? That uh, broke it? No. <laughs> it's like squadron it's like squadron hawk and jace. It's like squadron hawk and jace. Yo, but, Remember Jace shuffling in squadron hawks? Yo, it's basically uh, this, it's basically this is that. Not it's that. basically that. <laughs> this is Grandmaster so Flowers the next that. Jace. Is that what we're saying? It's, is this circle well, loyalty than, level? broken yeah <laughs> like like oh, it, morden canaan it, it is a cool a card loyalty good. i i do like morden canaan or kind of i don't know how you say his name morden canaan but the th but grandmaster of flowers is just not there for me right now it's just okay it doesn't the do, monk like, is too bad the, yeah. the monk is not good enough right I'm like you don't want it in them. your white weenie deck it's not strong enough you're not going to double spell enough you're gonna curve out right like what do you like you're gonna double spell with more monks right like how many one drops do you have the seven seven is fine but that's like any planeswalker ultimate right that means you manage to plus four uh plus one this thing four times uh so i guess you you have a strong creature but people can still exile it the other plus one has a lot of stipulations on it and i i don't know if it's good enough and i think the main problem is you just don't want to play four monks yeah, like you I like need a good shell for the four monks, and you don't want those in your deck. <laughs> I, I would. I was actually gonna say the best way to use this might be in like a a white weenie deck or like the mono white deck, but yeah, like th this this does seem decent there. It doesn't seem that bad there. But do you really want to be playing a one mana one one that you need a double spell to become a two two in white weenie, and you're gonna close <laughs> out by doing nothing by drawing more cards? Like how are you gonna close the game? Like your your I mean, opponent just swept the board. And then you're like, I make a 1-1 one, one again, right? Like, there's not enough pressure on Grandmaster of Flowers to close out White Weenie, right? Well, so uh, here would be my two arguments. One is, White Weenie is losing all of its one drops at rotation. Elsa itself is savior, giant killer. They're gone. A 1-1 a one, one for one that grows throughout the game might actually be one of the, like, three best options in post-rotation standard for the deck. <laughs> that tells me you don't the want to play White is, Weenie. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. 
<laughs> the first plus one also lets you force through damage, though. It makes a creature not attack or block, so you can just get your opponent's best blocker out of the way and smash in with all your 1-1s one for one, and all that adds up, and you're working towards the 7-7 seven, seven indestructible to, to finish things off. I, I'm i pretty high on it. I actually think it's the best Planeswalker in the set. We'll see. Maybe maybe I'll regret it like Circle of Loyalty when we're reviewing uh. this in six months, but for now, <laughs> obviously, everything we say today, or I say today, is... Mostly looking at post-rotation. I expect this set to do basically literally nothing in standard until after rotation because it's not as strong as Eldorade or Ikoria. So keep that in mind. I, I'm considering this for like post-rotation standard. For now, it's going to be Love Strike Beast and Bone Crusher Giants and Ultimatums for another two months until we finally get rotation. Is Elspeth rotating? Yes. The four mana yes. one? Yeah, four mana Elspeth. Yeah. yeah. Theros Beyond Death, yeah. Yeah? Yep. All right. All right, so... This is the best Planeswalker. We'll go to the two lesser ones. We'll see how they fare. <laughs> we got the red one. Zariel, Archduke of Avernus. Four mana value as well. Two red, red. Four starting loyalty. Plus one. Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and gain haste until the end of turn. My, uh, sorry, zero. Create a one, one red devil creature token with whenever this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. Minus six. You get an emblem with at the end of your first combat phase on your turn, untap target creature you control. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. E this card I actually think I might like a little bit more than the, the, the White Planeswalker, if I'm being honest. Uh, I mean, they kind of do the same thing, except this one doesn't really protect itself, but I, a deck that would play a card like this probably might be more aggressive. And that plus one might be a sleeper ability. In that you're going to get haste and, you know, a little bit of a, a mini anthem effect on your board. So, I and this ults a lot faster than, like, getting it to, like, becoming a 7-7 seven, seven or whatever, or the other card. So, I... I like this more than the white one yeah i mean i think it's i think it's decent i think you definitely got to be aggro yeah there's not much flexibility you got to have a lot of creatures you got to be an aggro deck it makes me think of like not that it'll show up here but something like the historic rule deck it's almost like a like an eight wax style planeswalker that's yeah. what the plus one is it's kind of like a goblin bushwalker on a planeswalker and it makes tokens so some sort of like go wide creature style deck maybe Maybe in standard it can work in like a transmogrify shell. We've seen like some takes on like transmogrify tokens where you're getting like Velomachus. This seems like a cool support piece for a transmogrify style deck where you're making tokens you can transmogrify. If you don't draw transmogrify, it's pumping your tokens. And then if you emblem, maybe you can just win with your one ones getting extra combat phases, like just by attacking with your tokens. So I think in the right shell, it can be very strong. Also, since those one ones are going to be things that like, uh, that when they die, they also ping for one more damage. These these creatures are pretty sweet. It, like they'll stick around, and then when they get swept or killed, they're also just you know as annoying as the little devils that like Tybalt would put out. Maybe maybe mono red. I think mono red's another deck that's gonna have to go under like a complete rebuild after rotation, and maybe this is good enough for whatever post rotation mono red looks like. Yeah, if I was gonna play white weenie. I would splash red and play Zariel. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you need an aggressive go wide. And this helps your game plan. And the ultimate is actually reasonable, right? Like two pluses and then ultimate. But then the ultimate isn't that game ending. Like you need a good board. You Like you only get one creature to untap. So you actually, it's a little weird because that's a like go big creature you want to untap. But you're playing a go wide deck. So is this really helpful? Uh, but it's still... You know, if your opponent is playing control, they have no blockers, doesn't matter, right? Like, you just hit them again. Um, but, yeah, I, I actually think this is decent. It could be strong. There are a lot of cards that make random tokens, and the, this allows you to kind of pump your team to, to get in there to finish, finish off the job. So, I like this more than the white one. Uh, last one is the blue one. Uh, Morden Kanan. Uh, four blue blue, so six mana value, five starting loyalty, plus two, draw two cards, then put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library, minus two, create a blue dog illusion creature token with this creature's power and toughness are equal to twice the number of cards in your hand, minus ten, exchange your hand and library, then shuffle, you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. Uh, I, okay, so I, I like this card. Of the planeswalkers, this one seems pretty sweet. 
uh, especially once Mystical Dispute leaves the format. Um, but the the thing here is like this this plus two seems super solid. Uh, getting getting to put one, I, I kind of wanted actually to be into the graveyard. That's the only thing. But draw two cards and then putting one to the bottom or a card from my hand to the bottom. By the way, not anything that was drawn. Like we can still draw two and then just put some junk back into the deck. Yeah, like a, like a Monk of the Open Hands. Yes, like a Monk of the Open Hands. Or the Planeswalker that would go and get that itself. Uh, but <laughs> if not that, then like, yeah, like you also get a Dog Illusion token. So, I mean, you know I'm going to like this. If you're telling me there's a Planeswalker that makes dogs? Yeah, I'm on board. And, and the minus 10, whatever. I, you know what I mean? You're, you're, I hope I win or do something wild with this minus 10. However, like, yeah, the plus two seems really, really good. Being able to put any card that's already in my hand to the bottom and not anything that was freshly drawn is pretty major. And getting a, getting a doggo out of it gives you a body, so I like that. I actually think this card's very strong, too. I mean, it is six mana. Six mana is a lot for a Planeswalker. We have seen six mana Planeswalkers succeed, but usually like one of, two of type play for the most part. So I don't think this is a four of type Planeswalker, but all the abilities are good. The dog will hopefully be good. It's a little, it's another one of those cards that's a little soft right now because of stuff that's going to rotate. Like Grim mentioned Mystical View. also. The dog does not get along very well with Brazen Borrower. That's uh, just kind of the hard answer to you making this like 12-12 with the negative two. Although speaking of the dog, that's actually a card in Magic. Matsumaru First to Live. It's a legend from Kamigawa. I didn't know this was an actual thing until I started researching this card. It has the exact same text. Its power and toughness is twice the number of cards in your hand. How much do you think that legendary creature costs? Like seven mana. <laughs> yeah, it's Five. six mana. Oh. It's six mana. The dog value, like those dogs, as an actual Magic card, okay, is a six mana gonna, value card. We're going to do that. Then my one drop was like eight mana in Legends. Okay, it was yeah. like Kamigawa. It was a long time ago, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It was a long time ago. But, I mean, still, if you're playing a control deck, it should be negative to make a 10-10 or make a 12-12 or a 14-14. And you can take it down twice. If you have our ultimate, you should just win. It's essentially like an enter the infinite where you just get to draw your entire deck. And as long as you can win before you mill yourself out, like, you should be able to. So... I mean, it's a lot of strong stuff on this card. I, My only catch is six mana is a lot. That's the issue. I think with it being six mana, I mean, it, it's being held to the bar of like Liliana, Dreadhorde General, uh, Elspeth, Sun's Champion, stuff like that. This should have been, I instead of the dog, as much as I love the dog, or you know what? You give it four abilities because why not? It's a six mana Planeswalker. You like minus four and it like bounces all creatures, see it like with, you know, attack power or something like four or greater so you know what i mean all, <laughs> it was, all not non-dog creatures yeah all non-dog <laughs> creatures with cmc like or, or i mean whatever power four or greater right like the the blue version of elspeth if you would i think that that could have totally been fine with the fact that this is once again a six mana planeswalker without a passive like lilies either that is that is one thing it's missing. If you think of six mana planeswalkers that actually see play, Liliana, Veraska saw play, some Soren saw play in the not super distant past. The one thing they tend to all have in common is a removal mode. And that's right. the one thing this is missing. Like the dog is good defense if it sticks around or it can be a big creature to defend. But that's one thing that Morden Canyon's missing that a lot of the playable six mana, or I think actually all of the playable six mana planeswalkers have had, is just like play this kills something to stabilize the board i don't know if that's a deal breaker like it's still a ton of card advantage and makes really big tokens but that is something to keep in mind that it is missing that removal mode and that really would have powered it up if it had a removal mode too yeah 100 percent. all right uh next up we have a cycle of legendary dragons at mythic uh, so we're going to go over some of the ones we think are good. First up is Ebon Death Dracolich, 4 mana value, 2 black black, it's a 5-2 zombie dragon, flash flying, it enters the battlefield tapped, uh, you may cast it from your graveyard if a creature not named Ebon Death Dracolich died this turn. Uh, I, I, I think this is the best one. <laughs> First off, it's 4 mana, right? It, it's 4 mana, it has flash flying on its own. 
right? I mean, you're not surprised blocking anybody because it enters the battlefield tapped. But the thing here is this just on its own means you could play it at the end of the opponent's turn. Uh, and then obviously the ability to keep casting it over and over again in, uh, let's just say, some kind of weird sacrifice deck or something like that. Uh, then this this seems amazing. I don't know. I, I love this card. I think I think even death's really good too. I don't think it's I wouldn't rank it number one. It's probably my number two of the dragon cycle, but it is really hard to kill and it's super aggressive. Five power flyer for four mana. That's a pretty good deal. That can close out games really quickly, and it triggers when any creature not named Even Death dies. So you can play this as your control finisher, where you just like flash it in if it dies, whatever, kill your thing, you know, on your end step, play it again, attack you. Oh, you killed it. Well, whatever. I'll heartless act you again, cast it again. Like it seems very difficult to deal with permanently outside of graveyard haze. So I think for standard, it's very good, and I think it could even have a chance to see play like. Maybe historic pioneer modern might be a bit of a stretch. It is competing with Rankle, and I'm not sure how it will work. Cause I was thinking, oh, you just play this in, in like mono black and pioneer historic, and it seems like it'd be fine, but it is, Rankle's a pretty strong card. They do synergize pretty well together. You can like discard this to Rankle and make uh, both players sacrifice and then immediately cast this as uh, from your graveyard because something died. Right. So it has cute synergies. I don't know how many four drop flyers you can play in an aggro deck but i do think it's a really good card modern zombies four drop is this a thing mm? uh, <laughs> it's actually mm? quite obnoxious to deal with but in standard four mana five power flying recursion recursion on anything uh is really really strong i think this will see a lot of play in standard uh, it might even see play in standard now uh, i think it's actually that strong and yeah, I mean, it's just on any creature dying. So you can kill your opponent's creatures or your creatures die, and then you just bring this back. Uh, it can't block. That's the that's the only downside to this card. But I think it's it really can. strong. It can. Just, just I mean, not it, surprised. Okay, it can't not block easily. at instant speed. Yeah. 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 Uh, next up, we have uh, Aimerith, Desert Dew. Three blue, blue. So five mana value, five, five. It's the blue one. Uh, it's just a dragon flying. It has ward four as long as it's untapped. Uh, whenever it deals combat da damage to a player, draw a card. Then if you have fewer than three cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference. This is my pick for number one dragon. So this is essentially Dragon Lord Ojutai. Very, uh. very, very similar to Dragon Lord Ojutai. I mean, it's same mana cost. It generates card advantage when you hit your opponent with it. It's got protection if it's untapped. Not as good a protection, but still ward four. It's not like it's ward one or something where it's just like, oh, like whatever. Sure, that doesn't even, that's flavor text essentially. Ward four is, that's meaningful. That means you need six mana to heartless act it or like whatever, you know, eight mana to kill it with a four mana removal spell. I think that that actually could be a pretty, uh, a pretty good card in standard. Dragon Lord Ojishai was legitimately one of the better cards in its format it the esper dragon deck was a top tier deck primarily because of dragon lord ojitai and it wasn't that long ago that ojitai saw play in modern it's been outclassed now by various teferis and stuff but there was a time when it was a legit control finisher back to modern i think this has got to be good enough it's also big enough as a five five to Stonefall, a lot of the other dragons that see play in standard, Galazeth, Prismari, things like that, the 5-5 five, five body is going to lock down the air and kind of uh, like Frost Titan in the Titan cycle. This is the dragon that beats the other dragons because its body is big enough to hold them off in combat. So I'm actually really high on Imareth. I, I think the card is good, but I don't I don't know if it's Ojitai. But it, it is very it, I think it is very solid. I, I probably have this as my number two uh, and, and even death is my number one. So th this card, once again, it, when it deals combat damage to a player, draws a card. Then if you have fewer than three cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference, right? So you're always going to draw a card, right? And and but then yes. but the difference here is Ojitai's ability to anticipate was more so card quality, and I and I like that a lot more. Now of course this could potentially draw us a bunch of sweet cards, or it draws me a ton of lands, right? Like like the thing here is I I I don't know. If the, like this is still powerful, it's just not Ojutai levels, and hexproof is still very different from Ward. Yeah, in, in control mirrors, you can kill this, but then again, like the the four is still a significant cost, right? It means you fire off removal spell. Well, you wait uh, they until they attack. You back, you're done. Well, yeah, they, yeah. well if, 
Ojitai, you can kill when it attacks too, right? Right, Isn't right. The, right. The same no, but when, it, when it's untapped, untapped, yeah, when it's untapped, you can't kill it, period. Yeah, right? like there, there is just no way you kill Ojitai when it's untapped. Yeah, but having said that, uh, I think this card is really strong. Uh, it doesn't actually win against other dragons, though. <laughs> like the Ebon Death is a 5-2, it trades. The red one's a 6-6, six, six. the green one is a 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, but it is a 5-5 five, five that will like stonewall like mono red or something. They're not going to have the mana to remove it. Uh, and, you know, it's not Ojitai, but, you know, are you really going to put down drawing up to three cards? Like, you know, it's still a pretty good deal. So I think this is really strong. I think you want to play this over the Planeswalker as your control finisher, but I don't know. We'll let Krim figure it out. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not even sure, like, this is a control deck card yet. If I think it's not. a tempo deck or an aggro deck card. Like, um, some kind of mid-range deck. I, I think you could play this. It is nice compared to Ojitai that it's one color too. So that yeah. does open up possibilities where blue black or is it or something where Ojitai, you know, you have the extra color requirement that kind of narrowed what it could go into. So there is some flexibility in being mono blue. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, I wish Silumgar Scorn was a thing or I don't know, you can call it Limerith Scorn. I don't, I don't care. Just reprint that <laughs> <laughs> under whatever name you need it to be under. Ah, Krim wants a counter spell in standard. I, uh, I, I yes, am not, I am not surprised. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> but I can see that, like the Demolich Desert Doom deck, where you just play like all counter spells and you know, like just card draw and things like that. And you just play these two as your finishers. I think that yeah, like mono blue thing. control. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Next up, Ventures. So last week. We talked about ventures. We didn't know what the venture cards did. We're like, okay, these dungeons seem cool. Well, now we have all of them. Uh, we'll talk about, I guess, Acerac, Lord of Unlife. Uh, it's a three drop, two and a black, five, five, legendary creature, zombie wizard. Uh, when Acerac enters the battlefield, if you haven't completed Tomb of Annihilation, return Acerac to its owner's hand and venture into the dungeon. When Acerac attacks for each opponent, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token, unless that player sacrifices a creature. So Acerac itself is sweet. Like Acerac, if you can make it free with like Allurin or Omniscience or Rooftop Storm, it gives you infinite dungeon completion out of any dungeon except Tomb of Annihilation. Because when it ventures, you can venture into any dungeon, not just Tomb of Annihilation. Some people are a little confused by that. So there's cool combos. It probably is the best venture card, Tomb of Annihilation. If you're going to play this fairly, it is the shortest dungeon to get through. You can potentially get there in three ventures and then a three mana five five with an attack trigger. That's that's like a love struck beast almost like we almost we almost <laughs> built an card really out of this. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think overall, boy, dungeons, they're a flop. When we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, I thought there was potential for the mechanic to end up uh, being pretty broken. But wizards went incredibly safe with venture like the cards they put it on are definitely not free value. They're cards that you probably don't want in your deck unless you're really dedicated to venturing for the most part. So maybe there's like a chance there's a tier two or tier three venture deck after rotation. But now that we've seen the venture cards, I am not at all worried about it being broken. And I was initially when we when we heard how the mechanic was going to work. Uh, I, th I think this card is like probably yeah, the best venture card. So... Uh, that that we've got in the in the whole set. The the yeah. only contender is the green one. I think that's the three mana three three. And when you cast a creature or planeswalker, you venture, but only once per turn. And then when you finish venturing, you get a wolf, uh, and it has ward and reach. But oh, yeah, actually, I don't know why they made these cards so conservative. It's just like mutate again. You're like, yeah, the whole point of the set is to build big monsters. But we'll just make this mechanic so conservative. No one will play it. And then instead, you know. Uro is fine, right? Like I, I don't, I don't understand, right? So, yeah, I don't know that we're racing to finish dungeons, right? Like maybe a combo comes up somewhere. Like Allure and Aceric is just a two card win because there's dungeons that uh, either draw your whole deck or just drain everyone. So if you can cast Aceric infinitely for free, you win on the spot. Uh, so that is a thing. But for actual playing the way it was intended, there's not enough value for all this time you you spend venturing. I yeah I'm still gonna try it yeah I, I still I still think that there can be like a 
a functional deck. I, I When it was first previewed, I was worried like, oh my god, this could be like Energy 2.0, where it just dominates the meta, it's the only game in town. I'm no longer worried about that, but I'm not so down on it that I don't think you can build a functional deck around the mechanic. Like, I think you still can. I think it can maybe be, like, second tier and compete, but I definitely don't think it's going to be the best mechanic or best deck in the format or anything. I I actually also think that I mean, there are still cards where I like, do I need to be fully a venture deck or can I just play some of these venture cards on their own? Like, I think the whatever, the blue snake rogue, the 2 1 Yuan T. Malison, that card is just unblockable and advent- it takes you, uh, it makes you venture every time you deal combat damage to a player. So I, th- I think there is still something venture. It's just not on the level of like energy that we were kind of hoping it'd be. All right. Next up. Uh, so we have dungeons. How about die rolling? Uh, we haven't talked about many die rolling cards. Uh, How die about rolling die is, rolling? <laughs> is a big thing in the set. Uh, we have the deck of many things at five mana value, five generic mana, legendary artifacts, mythic, two and tap, roll a d20 and subtract the number of cards in your hand. If the result is zero or less, discard your hand. Uh, one to nine. Uh, if the result of the die roll is 1 to 9, return a card at random from your graveyard to your hand. 10 to 19, draw 2 cards. 20, put a creature card from any graveyard <laughs> onto the battlefield under your control. When that creature dies, its owner loses the game. I, I don't ever want to get anything from my graveyard with this card. <laughs> like, like, But, but I, I will say that this card is very fun, but it's pretty bad. Like, like, if we're talking about a, like, competitive, uh, 60 card constructed format, whatever, this card is awful. And, and maybe, maybe that's just me, but I, I feel like it doesn't do enough of anything really. And I, if I roll a full 20, then okay, sure. I, maybe I get your card and then, and then I also have to sacrifice it or find a way to kill it. So, so I don't know. This, this deck is, this card is very, very fun to play and probably going to be a blast to play with in commander. But in a 60 card format, I, th- I think this thing is kind of unplayable. I mean, all the modes are relatively relatively i mean obviously one with nothing away your hand is bad but if you dodge the one with nothing away your hand all the other modes are relatively good uh, you, you, i mean you regrow something two mana divination rolling a 20 is kind of win the game with extra steps which isn't bad so i i mean it's five mana it's really hard to make sense of and it's worth mentioning that you got to be empty handed to even have a chance to roll a 20 because of the subtraction method. So it, there are a lot of hoops to jump through to make it good. So it probably is just a commander card, but also you, that's probably a good thing. You got to remember that on that last part, it, the creature has to die for them to lose the game. So if it gets bounced or exiled, <laughs> you've gone through a lot <laughs> yeah, of hoops to <laughs> not even do anything and give them back a creature. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is true. There is there is risk with the deck of anything. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's good though because I don't really think we want die rolling to be like a top tier mechanic. I remember how frustrated like uh, frustrating Etherworks Marvel was and just the swinginess where it's like oh I I flip a coin and sometimes it's I win the game and sometimes it's I play a puzzle knot and it I didn't really like that play pattern. So I think that they went conservative with die rolling, but in this case I think it's a really good thing because I would hate tournament magic if that even is a thing anymore to be just to come down to a bunch of die rolls. I don't think that would be especially fun, but I do think we <sighs> build like a sweet against odds card around this, uh, a sweeter against the odds deck around this card. And I would definitely play it in commander decks, especially if I have a die rolling theme. But even without a dice rolling theme, it's not bad in commander. It's the even 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 in commander. This is still a, a pretty medium. Uh, like it's it, it's a lot better than where it would be in a 60 card format, but it's still pretty medium. <laughs> you got to embrace the chaos. Oh, embrace oh, the variance. You're, embrace you're, the you're chaos. You're playing mono white. See what happens. You're super desperate for card draw. <laughs> <laughs> you play the deck of any. This like when Seth pays 12 mana to draw like a card. Like this is what we're talking about. <sighs> I'm very disappointed that they decided to make die rolling not competitive because what is the point of this set? Exactly. When I play standard, am I going to get any iconic D&D things now, right? I don't have dungeons. I don't have die rolling. What am I doing? So I, I don't like that, right? If they should have made these iconic things playable 
and, and balanced it so that we actually feel like we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, because now the only way to realize it is if you know the lore, right? And I don't know the lore, so I don't know what's going on, right? But if I'm rolling D20s, that feels very D&D &D to me. So I don't know. I just don't like basically Ikoria, right? Like the whole set is about giant monsters. We're not playing any giant monsters, right? If this whole set is dungeoning and die rolling, like are we doing any of this or are we just playing generic fantasy cards again, right? So I I, re I, I kind of hope that these would be playable and standard. I, I, I do think that there are people that are, aren't happy about die rolling at all in Dungeons and Dragons. And, and I think that all of that right now is also a little bit, silly because I, I, th I think magic has always had the variance anyways so i'm not too upset about the variance uh of, of like a lot of the cards from this set uh i am i am just more so excited to roll like a one when i need <laughs> i'm gonna be a little <laughs> bit sad when i when i need something to happen and i roll a one but uh like i don't know maybe maybe this die rolling the, the, the issue with a lot of these cards is like the the ranges of the effects that you will get are so so drastic it's like oh my god i can either ba like give something minus one minus zero or or like get a bomb back right like it's like what <laughs> so it is pretty funny and i can't wait to see what happens it does make a lot more content <laughs> let's go with that next up we have asmodeus the arc fiend four black black six six legendary creature devil god Binding Contract. If you would draw a card, exile the top card of your library face down. Instead, black, 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 draw seven cards. A single black, return all cards exiled uh, with Asmodeus to their owner's hand, and you lose that much life. It's a it's a fixed Grizzle Brand. It's a I mean it's 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 pretty fixed compared to Grizzle Brand, but it's a really powerful card. I mean that's essentially what pay four mana in seven life to draw seven. That's a pretty legitimately good deal. I mean, a standard will have to wait and see. It is a card that you have to untap with or get up to 10 mana, which is asking a lot. So that is a bit of a drawback. You play your six drop. You got to wait to untap to draw cards. It gets killed in the meantime. But at least in Commander, I feel like that's a, a pretty legit card draw effect. I think I would jam this in a lot of different Commander decks, uh, mono black decks, just as one of my card advantage spells. Uh, <laughs> I, I can just play painful truths and call it a day or siphon mine or ambitions cost okay necropotence <laughs> but remember like you had to pay six or entomb reanimate this thing onto the battlefield before you managed to pay four to draw seven at seven like it was a lot of work so i think you need to win on the spot if you're gonna do this or just play one of the easier, like, just play, like, a Promise of Power, like, just five mana, draw five, call it a day, right? Like, um, I don't know. But I it's think... also seven mana, draw 14. It scales. <laughs> think of all the cards that could be drawn, Richard. Necropotence, three really? mana. Draw a lot <laughs> you wouldn't of cards. Play this in... no. You wouldn't play it in Commander decks. As, not, as, like, like, not as a staple. You have to play Reanimator, right? Like, you would just six mana, hope it lives, on top. <laughs> Remember, it also kills your draw droppers. phase, right? Like, if you have this on the battlefield, it kills your... It's like Necropotence, right? It kills your draw phase. So you need to pay the mana and pay the life to get the card you're, you're supposed to draw. That is that is a bit obnoxious, that's true, to have to pay one each turn to get your card from the draw phase. But if it's on the battlefield, I'm assuming you're going to also be able to pay the three, and then you're kind of okay with it. The, the other drawback is it doesn't have lifelink or anything, so this is going to add up. Like, paying one a turn to draw your card for a turn and paying seven to draw three, or seven to draw seven, that's going to kill you pretty quickly. So I think you're going to have to maybe build around it to some extent or plan on just activating it once definitely way worse than grizzle brand because you don't get the auto draw when it enters the battlefield all right next up we have i guess the last D, D like thing we have the uh classes so classes are enchantments uh they work they're like kind of like sagas where they have multiple levels but you have to manually pay they're, they're like level up enchantments or sagas you can think of uh but we have the paladin class here a, a single white spells your opponent's cast during your turn costs one generic more to cast. Uh, you can pay two to white to get to level two. Creatures you control get plus one plus one. 
Uh, level 3 is 5 mana. Whenever you attack until end of turn, target attacking creature gets plus 1 plus 1 for each other attacking creature and gains double strike. I, I think this is a pretty cool card. Like, the all of these classes so far uh, seem, for the most part, pretty solid. And Paladin class... Right, like this is just a static effect, regardless of whether you, you know, b level it up or not. You're gonna just, you're just gonna leave this on board, and it's gonna always make your opponent stuff cast or cost one more to cast. And on top of that, you can stack these. So, yeah, it's not even a legendary enchantment or anything like that. So this seems really good at one mana. Yeah, I think the the class enchantments are probably the strongest part of the set. And Paladin class, if you're playing some sort of white aggro deck seems pretty good like it slows down counter spells and other instant speed reaction when you're up against control decks and up against mid-range decks it gives you a relatively on curve anthem like glorious anthems three mana so i guess you are paying one extra because you got to pay the level up and the mana cost but still that's pretty powerful and then you can potentially one shot someone if you build a big board stick them all the skyclaves on a creature and make that the creature that gets plus one plus one and double strike that's a huge double striking evasive clock to close out the game so I think that definitely can see standard play. I, I have a question to ask you, though. Is this going to be good in Soul Sisters? Maybe. Actually, no, this one isn't. But Cleric Class, the uncommon <laughs> white enchantment, that one might be. <laughs> all right. All right. I mean, I got to hear it. You know, like, what is the Soul Sisters pick for you this set, Seth? <laughs> I'm still I'm still working it over. We got our top ten videos coming up. Don't worry, I'll have something for you in the next few days. Okay, okay. So this card actually works with Grand Master of Flowers. Like you play the monk mm -hmm. and you play this. Mm -hmm. It's a one drop, right? It allows you to double spell to actually pump the monk. And then if for some reason you actually get to your ultimate on Grand Master of Flowers and you get to ultimate this thing, it's like a one shot, right? So it could work, but I actually just like the taxing effect. I think the taxing effect is like the really strong part. You can stack them and then uh, you can just anthem to finish or even anthem and then pump to finish. So uh, the fact that they stack makes it really strong. I really like and I like all the the, the class cards in general. Yeah, um, I, th I think I think the the class this is going to be the the D, D feel for what like i mean because i've only played D, D once i wouldn't say i'm a master tier D, D player by any means uh but like this this is probably the closest thing to like the most notable like thing from D, &D to come into magic from this set uh i i think the classes are, are just a home run uh, like almost all of them are really solid uh, and very flavorful so i like example like i'm really excited for the rogue class so that that card just seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. Like just having that out there, exiling stuff off the top of my opponent's library. Uh, like just a lot of these cards seem really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, fighter I think class is like a, just a uh, equipment tutor that is like will be a staple in every Boros deck. So a lot of these classes will see play uh, in a lot of places. Uh, next up, we have a cycle of creature lands. Um, they all... They're all monocolored. They do kind of the same thing. If you control two or more other lands, they enter tapped. Uh, so they're kind of like the fast lands. They tap to add a color of uh, the color they're supposed to add. And they all have different abilities. So the red one uh, is four mana until end of turn. Den of the Bugbear becomes a 3-2 goblin creature token with whenever this creature attacks, create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. It's still a land. Uh, Layer of the Hydra is the green one. Uh, you pay X in green, it becomes an XX green Hydra creature. Uh, X can't be zero. Hall of the Storm Giants. Uh, six mana becomes a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant creature with board three. Uh, so those are some of the, the better ones we thought. What do you guys think about these new cycle of lands? And also they have the classic module art versions as well, which make them even more cool. Uh, I, I think a good amount of these are actually, per, like, for the most part, they're pretty good. Uh, I think the red one is the best one, in my opinion. Um, and then I would then say that it's probably the green one and then the 
blue or black one can be tied, and then the last one is is the white one. But just okay. I I do I am a little bit worried about the the blue one being seven mana or whatever six mana to get to its uh, creature form. Uh, and I think it gets like ward three or something. Ward four. Ward three. Yeah, ward it's three. Six mana for seven seven with ward three. That's okay, right? I, I I think this could be something good for control. It doesn't have like flying. It doesn't have unblockable. It doesn't have trample. So you can't just get like stonewalled by a simple like death touch creature on the ground. But for the most part, I I do like the the lands. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this entire cycle is pretty good. They can come into play untapped, which is kind of huge. They're formatted kind of like fast lands, and we haven't really had creature lands that come into play untapped. We've had some colorless ones, but we've never had colored ones, and I think that's actually a really, really big deal. I think the red one that we talked about, it's much more appealing for like mono red aggro to play a card like this when it can come into play tapped on turn one and turn two. That's another reason I'm high in the green one. Green decks are often built around Llanowar Elves and Elvish Mystics, these one drop mana dorks. It's really painful to play a bunch of tap lands, but this can get around that. Like sure, it's coming into play tap later in the game, but you can deal with that if you can curve out over the first couple turns. So I think that being untapped is huge. I'm highest on the green one, I think, just because of the flexibility. It seems pretty insane in any sort of ramp deck where in the late game this can easily be like an 8-8 or a 9-9 or something ridiculous but I think the entire cycle is going to be standard playable like whenever we get uh, creature lands they're really good and I wouldn't be surprised to see them show up in older formats as well only drawback is Faceless Haven's pretty busted and when I think about some of them like the mono red one I'm like ah okay like would I rather have this in my mono red deck or Faceless Haven because I'm not sure I can play both because I need so many snow covered lands and this keeps me from turning on Faceless Haven and Faceless Haven being four power attacker with only three to activate and vigilance so you can maybe get that mana back after combat is really really strong so that's my only question is if if they're going to be able to beat out Faceless Haven for various standard slots all right and I think those are most of the good cards that we, we plucked out. The whole set is out. We can't cover every card. Any last thoughts? Any cards we didn't touch that you guys are super hyped about? I, I, I must admit, when I looked at this list, they have clearly powered down standard. Yeah. So we're going to wait for Eldraine because I'm like, what are the good cards? Question mark, question mark, dot, dot, dot. I don't know. Uh, but when Eldraine rotates, then maybe it's a different story where some of these cards will actually get a chance to shine. But, you know, everything dies to Bone Crusher Giant. Everything gets blocked by Lovestruck Beast. So we're going to have to wait on the set for a bit before... Uh, before the sees play i think some cards i think that are going to be at this point i mean when we're talking about the power level of this set which is clearly low i'm just going to mention that i'm really excited we have loyal warhound blink dog lots of dogs coming in you know that's kind of cool <laughs> and and you know i like dogs that's all i'm getting out of this so <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I very much agree with Richard that I'm very much looking forward to rotation. Good news is, apparently Innistrad launches on Arena on September 8th. I thought, thought it was going to be later than that. So we are essentially two months away from Standard finally rotating. In the meantime, I'm hyped for some of the janky combos. Like, I'm hyped to try to assemble Caldera with Book of Vile Darkness. I'm excited to try the deck of many things, even though I don't expect it to be good, just because it seems absolutely hilarious. I'm excited about the the angel combo with uh, the Book yep. of Exalted Deeds, being able to turn Faceless Haven into, like, a, a platinum angel that's in your mana base. So that's going to be my focus over the short term, is just exploring some of these, like, janky weird things. And then, once we have rotation, in almost exactly two months then I think this set's going to look pretty good because when you think about what's left in standard Zendikar, Strixhaven, Kaldheim I think those are all sets that are basically on a similar power level to this sure this set looks powered down compared to Eldrain and Ikoria but those sets were super busted compared to the other stuff that's going to be in the format after rotation I think that some of this stuff's going to compete even the stuff that we're kind of like glossing over now because we're so used to the power level of standard being like off the charts high I think a lot of that stuff's actually going to look a lot more playable as long as Innistrad isn't like super busted. That would be my only concern is that Innistrad is like the next Eldorade and then all this stuff gets pushed to the sidelines anyway, but it really seems like Wizards has managed to reign in the power level of standard and I actually think we might have a pretty exciting standard after rotation. Yeah. Anyway, 
I think uh, any fish mail today, Richard. Uh, I think we can hold off fish mail for next week since we don't we're running long already. Well, where should uh, should people send fish mail for next week? All right, you can send them to MTG Fish Mail or hashtag MTG Fish Mail on Twitter uh, to at MTG Goldfish, and we'll get to your questions on air. And on that note, that brings us to the end of episode 336 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Richard Krim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk about whatever goes on in the world of magic. So, until then, have an amazing week, everyone. Enjoy the launch of Forgotten Realms. And this is the crew signing out. 